And then the final one is about giving us all a consistent experience across different contexts so that every time we do use our identity information on the internet we have a consistent experience and what that teaches us is any time the experience is different it's a time to worry so if if every time i log into my corporate network i go through consistent experience well i log into the microsoft network so it's control alt delete i hit control alt delete my uh, active directory prompts me for my credentials if i did that and something different happened one day then I'm immediately suspicious of what's happening. We don't have that kind of an experience on the internet. Every website asks for information in a different way. So these these laws, really, you can think of them as architectural principles. If we design an internet identity system, or even an enterprise identity system, because the, in, the enterprise is these days using internet technologies internally and externally anyway, then if I design that system, it needs to really look at these ideas of user control and consent, minimal disclosure for defined use, justifiable, justifiable, depart, justifiable parties, directional identity, pluralism of operators and technologies, human integration and consistent experience across contexts. Now let's have a look at a few of these laws and how we can build a system which looks at these laws and looks to solve these problems. Let's have a look at the two most important ones from a point of view of safety. Here is a card. It's called Planky's card. It's got a picture of me on it, and um, it's the it's the great metaphor for identity interactions. We're all familiar with cards. We have wallets which are full of them. Each one of the cards in our wallets represents our identity relationship with a provider of identity information. So, here's Planky's card. Here is a collection of cards, and you can see Planky's card is in that collection of cards, as is my Barclay card, my CBB's card, my Derby Council card, my HM Revenue and Customs card, and so on. I have a service running on the internet, or on a network, called an identity provider. The identity provider uh, talks to a subject, and the identity provider has a database. And if I have a look at that database, it will have information about the individual users registered to the system. First name, last name, email, user account, user ID, password, f um, address, um, telephone number, date of birth, whatever seems relevant to that identity provider. And what the identity provider does is it creates a card, rather like the uh, cards in our wallet, but it's not a card in the, th in the sense of being a piece of plastic. It's a data artifact. It may have an image on it, but it's a data artifact. It's an XML, a signed XML document. And that card then gets issued to a subject who has a computing device. And that computing device has its identity selector, otherwise known as the card collection, into which the card is installed. Now let's have a look at some features of this card, um, of this software, sorry. It's locally installed software, when that means it's not under somebody else's control. Unlike the web server that we saw earlier, where you log in and the web pages are under somebody else's control. No, this is a consistent piece of software. Every time it's installed onto somebody's machine, it gives the same user experience. So, an identity selector is one of the things which will help in creating a consistent experience across contexts. We need to account cater for the fact that there will be many identity providers, and there will be many of them. There already are many of them on the internet, and we do like the idea of compartmentalizing our lives into different identity interactions. There are a number of governments around the world who believe that um, their citizens could benefit from having a single identity for every interaction they do on the internet. Whether they're opening a bank account, whether they're paying their taxes, whether they're buying something from a website, whether they're booking a flight, whether they're booking cinema tickets, whatever they're doing, um, there is a feeling among some governments that it's good to have that all captured in a single card. And at first, uh, for first glance, it seems like a, a fantastic idea because it means rather than having ten cards in your wallet, you have one. But then there are dangers with this, of course. Um, the danger of your government being able to track every time you book a cinema ticket, make a flight, buy something from a website, every time you 
um, create a, a bank account every time you spend some money. Um, they could create an audit trail of all the things that you've done and who knows what will be done, what that information will be used for in the future. Once you've left that audit trail behind, it, it's in a database. It's in a database to be used by somebody in the future if they so choose. And so the danger, the typical danger in this situation is where, um, let's just say, a government introduces a new law ten years from now in which they can go back over the audit trail that's been left by you as a c citizen with your single card and they can look for patterns. And maybe they spot a pattern which, may, which flags you up as a possible criminal. And let's just say that the law in the future says that all possible um, criminals that match this pattern can be detained for five years. Sounds like a far-fetched sort of thing, but um, it has happened in the past. And so um, that's, what that, that's where the danger comes from not compartmentalizing your life into different interactions in which one single enormous identity provider has a view over everything that you've ever done on the internet. Okay, so we need to have an identity system which caters for the fact that there will always be multiple identity providers on the internet. There's a one-to-one -one relationship between identity providers and the cards they issue. So each identity provider can issue multiple cards, can issue many millions of cards, but each card can only come from a single identity provider. The cards themselves don't contain any data. They only contain metadata. In the same way that my credit card doesn't contain my details of my last purchase, it doesn't contain my current balance, it doesn't contain details of the last time I paid um, some of the balance off my credit card, it doesn't contain any of that kind of detail. So the metadata that's contained in one of these cards is the URI of the identity provider, uh, claims you can get from the identity provider, so for example, given name, last name, email, user ID, etc. But it doesn't contain the data itself. The data itself is intentionally left, left blank. And that leads us to the question, where, where can you get the data from? Well, do you remember that identity provider? That identity provider had a database which contained all that data. So the card is really the key that can be used to unlock that database which is a service running on the internet or on your enterprise network. The card also contains a digital signature, it's digitally signed by the identity provider. And what that means is that there's a cryptographic binding between the card and the identity provider. This card can only have come from this identity provider. So when you click that card and the request, the, the software looks at the request, sees where the card came from, and can only send the request to that specific identity provider. This cryptographic binding is a key feature for eliminating the phishing attack surface from a solution which uses cards. These cards are called information cards. There are a number of um, documents which define them. There's the information card interoperability profile, there are two versions of that, version 1 and version 1.5. They're available from a number of sources, um, but I know it as being available from Microsoft.com. If you go to Microsoft.com and search for Information Card Interoperability Profile, you'll find those documents.